without further ado, today, Dr. Thomas E. Graham joins us for a lecture titled, Why Can't We Get Along? Dr. Graham is a distinguished fellow at the Council of on Foreign Relations and senior advisor to Kissinger Associates Incorporated. In the past, uh, Dr. Graham has served as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the National Secu Security Council staff. In this capacity, he managed to the strategic dialogue between the White House and the Kremlin, an undoubtedly difficult yet necessary undertaking. Dr. Graham started learning Russian when he was just 13 years old, and after finishing high school, he ventured up the East Coast to New Haven, pursuing his BA in Russian studies at Yale University. Sometime later, Dr. Graham would become the co-founder of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program at Yale University. He has taught courses on US-Russian relations there, is currently a research fellow at the Macmillan Center, and serves on this faculty steering committee of Yale's Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program. While Yale obviously occupies a very special place for Dr. Graham, he nevertheless completed his doctorate in political science for Har from Harvard University, and currently serves on the advisory board of Russian Matters, which is a project of the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Completing his illustrious career, complementing, excuse me, his illustrious career in academia, Dr. Graham has also served as a foreign service officer for 14 years. Perhaps particularly interesting to all of us fellows who participated in the policy memo workshop just last week, Dr. Graham did two tours of duty at the US Embassy in Moscow, one in the late Soviet period and another in the middle of the 1990s. Between these two tours in Moscow, he worked on Russian and Soviet affairs on the policy planning staff at the US Department of State and as a policy assist assistant in the office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. He has since remained active in academic circles that I've mentioned before, serves on the Kennan Council at the Wilson Center and on the editorial board of a US Canada journal on Russia studies. He actively publishes on Russia and foreign policy related issues in various media outlets, including foreign affairs, one of which have been required reading for us today. So thank you kindly, Dr. Graham for joining us today and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, Tina, for that kind introduction. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today, uh, even if it has to be virtual. Uh, I've taken a look at all your bios uh, it is a very accomplished group of fellows this year, um, as we've had in the past. Uh, and I always approach a group like this with some trepidation, uh, since uh, just looking at your bios, you know uh, a lot about a lot of things that I wish I knew more about when it comes to Russia and U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, Tina laid out um, my, my bio very, very briefly. Uh, I would only add a couple of points. Uh, she did mention that I worked at the American Embassy in Moscow, the very end uh, of the Soviet period, um, this period of tremendous, uh, I think, hope, uh, a very exciting period. Uh, I like to tell people with the with a little help from my Russian friends, we managed to bring down communism uh, in Russia at that time. Uh, in the middle of the 1990s, uh, I was there uh, around the time of the uh, presidential campaign, the re-election of Yeltsin. Um, so my uh, foreign policy career started off uh, with a, a tremendous success, at least as far as American uh, foreign policy cons is concerned. By the time that I served with uh, in the George W. Bush administration uh, was less su successful, if I could uh, say so myself. Uh, I arrived at the National C uh, Security Council staff uh, just after the Moscow-St. Petersburg summit. Uh, the NATO-Russia summit uh, in June of uh, 2002. This was really a high point uh, of relations between our two countries in the post-Cold War period. Uh, the president had signed a joint declaration uh, which lay out a, a framework for strategic partnership between our two countries. And in the ensuing months, uh, we put a great deal of effort in trying to put some flesh uh, onto this framework. Uh, I left the, uh, the Security Council staff 72 hours before President Putin gave his uh, very famous or infamous state speech uh, as far as the United States is concerned at the Munich Security Council in, two, in February 2007, castigating the United States uh, for its unipolar ambitions, uh, for its failure to take Russian interest into account. Uh, and this was really a signal uh, from the Russian side, from President Putin personally, uh, that Russia was no longer interested 
uh, in the full integration in the Euro-Atlantic community that have been the guiding principle behind American policy since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, so you can see the trajectory uh, that US-Russian relations followed uh, while I was largely responsible for it on the National Security Council staff. Uh, what I can say is that after I left, the relationship continued to deteriorate. And of course, uh, it began its real sharp downward spiral after the events in and around Ukraine in 2014. Uh, so the search for partnership, uh, strategic partnership that the United States launched uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, in which Russia was initially a very willing partner, uh, has come full circle. Uh, and we are now in a position that looks much like the very last, not even the very last days of the Cold War, as some of the darkest days in the second half of the Cold War in the early 1980s. Uh, and so the question that I have dealt with uh, since I left government in 2007 uh, is really the question of why did this happen? Uh, why didn't we reach these aspirations? Why do we find ourselves uh, in these difficult circumstances now? Uh, I am in the process of writing a book on this topic. And what I want to do uh, in my initial remarks with you today uh, is share some of my uh, initial thoughts. And I'm very interested in your reaction uh, uh, to see where I may improve uh, the argument that I'm making. Now, my explanation uh, has a, an historical uh, aspect to it. And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to talk a little bit about the history of US-Russian relations then about uh, how expansion has figured in the policies of both the United States and Russia, and what complications that has created for the overall relationship, uh, and then with some thoughts on the issue of exceptionalism uh, in perhaps a Russian variant and an American variant, and again, the complications that that causes for our relationship. And all of this, as I said, is a way to try to answer the question of why we can't get along today. So let's start with the history. Uh, if you look at the history of American US-Russian relation, there really is uh, a period of very amicable relations from 1776, the, the war of independence in the United States until I would say uh, roughly 1867, the sale uh, by the Russian government of Alaska to the United States. Uh, this is a time when the educated public in both countries uh, thought quite highly of the other country. Uh, we were both uh, in the minds of American, uh, in, in particular young, that is young to the European system, but we were also non-European, we were dynamic, robustly growing powers. Uh, and American sense a certain sort of affinity uh, with Russia at that time, although the absolute level of knowledge about Ru Russia uh, was quite low. Uh, I think the same thing was true on the Russian side as well. Uh, if you look at uh, some actual events during this time, uh, there is what some future historians, commentators would call evidence of good cooperation between the United States and Russia. And the events that we look to are largely the War of Independence, uh, when Catherine the Great rejected an offer from uh, the English King George III to send troops to help suppress uh, these rebellious colonies uh, in North America. Uh, we point to the Crimean War, uh, where the United States uh, refused to uh, ally with the, uh, the French and the British uh, and the Turks in an attack on, on Russia, maintained its neutrality during that war, war. And then others in the final episode is the United States Civil War, uh, where Russia was the only major power that stayed steadfast in its relationship uh, with the North throughout the entire, uh, the entire conflict. Great right, Britain and France at that time were flirting with the, uh, the Confederacy and contemplated recognizing it as an independent state and the belligerent in that conflict. Uh, so people have argued that all of this laid the basis for an amical relationship. Now, uh, the one thing that didn't get in the way uh, of the good relations that has become a problem uh, uh, subsequently is the question of values. Um, it was a Republican Democratic United States uh, and autocratic Russia. And it wasn't that the two countries weren't aware of these great differences, uh, but it is, simply didn't matter in the overall relationship. 
uh, the United States was focused on building democracy uh, and expanding westward across the continent uh, and wasn't all that interested uh, in what the domestic structures of other countries were. Uh, a very famous uh, quotation or uh, set of remarks by John Quincy Adams sort of lays out the way uh, the American public and the American government thought of uh, democracy promotion at that time. And let me read you uh, this short passage from his oration on July 4th in 1821. And so what he said was, whenever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be America's heart, her benedictions, and her prayers. But she does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to freedom and independence for all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Uh, so we weren't going to make an issue of what was happening inside Russia. Uh, and Russia uh, at that time, while it was a supporter of monarchical rule throughout Europe, uh, really didn't have much uh, to do with what was happening in the Americas. It was too far distant for Russian concerns. Now, I think if you look at the amical relations at this point, you'll see that the foundation uh, really is the fact uh, that the United States and Russia really operated in different spheres. Uh, Russia was focused on Europe, the European balance of power. The United States was focused on, on North America and expanding westward. Uh, where we did come into conflict uh, in Alaska, for example, where we were both present, we both had interests, uh, the Tsarist regime was very willing uh, to, to concede to American interest, uh, to American uh, request in part because it had more important issues to deal with uh, on the European continent. Uh, and finally, uh, as I said, the values issue really didn't get in, in the way. So the foundation for good relations uh, was the fact that neither country really had a good reason to be a rival of the other. Uh, uh, adequate for the time, but hardly the, the foundation for an enduring uh, friendship between the two countries. And indeed, if you look at the last quarter of the 19th century, the first two decades uh, of the 20th century, the situation changes dramatically. And it changes dramatically because of developments, I would argue largely uh, in the United States, but to a, a lesser extent, things that happen in Russia as well. Uh, the late 19th century was a period of very dramatic growth uh, in the United States. Uh, it was at this point that the United States rose to be the preeminent uh, industrial power in the world. By the, 19th, by the end of the 19th century, the United States was outproducing Europe as a whole in things like steel, coal production, energy, electricity generation, uh, and so forth. Uh, it was a country that had uh, come to a, uh, a sense of its own identity, the role that it was going to play on the global stage. Uh, and we've been became very interested then, uh, not only in the quality of our institutions at home, uh, but spreading those democratic in institutions abroad. Uh, we had completed the westward expansion of the country. We occupied the North American continent. Uh, and our dynamism took us abroad, south uh, into the Caribbean, but most important for the issue of US-Russian relations, west across the Pacific, uh, into Northeast Asia. During the same time, Russia uh, was in the midst of a, a long imperial crisis uh, that began with the humiliating defeat in the Crimean War, uh, which led to a series of uh, internal reforms, all known as Alexander, uh, Alexander II's Great Reforms. Uh, Russia uh, began to industrialize quite rapidly at the very end of the 19th century. But the problems that the, uh, that the the empire faced really came from the growth of nationalism uh, as a, a very sort of potent force in European affairs, uh, had a dramatic impact on the stability of what was a multinational, a large multinational empire, and also the process of modernization uh, and urbanization created a proletariat that became a hotbed of rev revolutionary agitation, in part because it didn't fit fit neatly into the social structures uh, that formed the, uh, the framework for the, for the Russian empire at that time. Uh, and this led these two developments, this asymmetric development in the United States and Russia 
led to a conflict over values uh, and a geopolitical friction uh, between the two countries. The conflict over values actually comes in things that were to dominate relations between the countries in the 20th century over the Jewish question uh, and dissidents. Uh, the Americans uh, were very concerned that American Jews were being discriminated when they went to Russia uh, engage in business activities. Uh, the Russian government didn't think there was any discrimination because it was only treating American Jews the way it treated Russian Jews uh, or Jews uh, in the Russian Empire at that time, which from our standpoint was quite, uh, was quite poor. Uh, on the dissident side, uh, the key figure here uh, was an individual whose name you have heard, but it's not that uh, individual, it's George Kennan. Uh, actually, a, a relative of the George Kennan who laid out the foundation for the containment policy uh, during the Cold War. But it was another George Kennan who was perhaps America's first great scholar of Russia, who took a trip to explore the penal and exile system in Siberia in the 1880s and came away uh, convinced that this was a very oppressive regime. He came away impressed by uh, the quality of some of the political pr uh, prisoners. And then he launched on a uh, a writing and uh, lecture campaign in the United States uh, to portray Russia as a despotic power, which had a, a dramatic influence, impact on shifting American opinion away from a fairly positive view of Russia to a very negative one. And both of these currents came together in the early 20th century to put pressure on the US government to begin to change the way it dealt with Russia. The second, uh, area, in addition to this values sort of friction that we had, came with uh, an expansion across the uh, Atlantic by the United States to Northeast Asia, Manchuria in particular. Manchuria in the late 19th century had also become a particular focal point of Russian expansion. Uh, it was hoped that Russia could use expansion uh, into uh, the Far East through Manchuria uh, as a way of jumpstarting modernization and industrialization in Russia, railroad building. Uh, but there was also uh, widespread in view in St. Petersburg at that time uh, that it made sense to ultimately annex Manchuria into the Russian Empire. And so they, St. Petersburg launched a, uh, a policy of the soft annexation, annexation of Manchuria. This is what raised concerns in the United States uh, that the Russians would ultimately close off Manchuria uh, as a market uh, for American entrepreneurs, industrialists, uh, something that would cut off uh, the resources markets that the United States needed uh, uh, to, to nourish its dynamically growing economy back in the United States. And so we begin to see tension uh, between the two countries develop uh, and reach uh, such uh, proportion that the United States in the initial phases of the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 actually tilted towards Japan. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the president at that time, wanted Japan uh, to win a victory as a way of cutting the Russians down in size uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the Orient, in East Asia. And so this value conflict uh, and this geopolitical competition came uh, to frame the relationship between the two countries in the early 20th century. And we see this unfold uh, throughout the, the 20th century uh, through uh, the initial period after the revolution of 1917, obviously the Cold War. Uh, it abates uh, during the early post-Soviet period when we're trying to build strategic partnership. But both these issues have come back uh, quite robustly since 2014. Now, I want to turn to the, the questions of expansionism uh, and exceptionalism to make the argument that the reason that we have this sort of this conflict in values on this geopolitical friction is grounded in the way the two countries developed historically. Uh, and we'll start with the expansion uh, part of the puzzle. Uh, if you bring up your uh, mental map uh, of Russia uh, and locate uh, the early uh, state of, uh, of Muscovy, you'll see that Russia, the Muscovite estate, uh, emerged in a geographic region 
uh, where no great power should have emerged, right? It's a, uh, it's a harsh climate, cold temperatures, uh, the soil is poor. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to eat out a living uh, in this area. Uh, uh, and this had, a, I think, a, uh, a dramatic impact on the way the Muscovite state developed. It had to expand uh, in order to find uh, adequate soil, produce the food that it needed to survive. Uh, it also engaged uh, in a process of dynastic um, reunification, what has historically come to be known as the gathering of the Russian lands. Uh, initially, uh, traders uh, began to move across the Urals into Siberia and across Siberia in the mid 16th century uh, in, in search of furs and other <clears throat> products of the, of the forest region as a way of supporting them, followed by uh, the Muscovite state, state officials uh, for some time. Uh, and then the dramatic part of the expansion, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, as the Muscovite state begins to move southward, uh, and security becomes the primary consideration uh, for, for the Russian state. How do you defend yourself against these various nomadic tribes, um, warriors that were moving across the steppe at this time? Uh, you had experienced nearly two centuries of <clears throat> overlordship by the, by the Mongols, uh, in, in prior centuries, uh, nomadic raids continue to be a tremendous problem for the, uh, the Muscovite state into the 16th century. Uh, Moscow was sacked by the, by the Tartars as late as 1571, for example. And so you expand it outward uh, to try to uh, build barriers against um, these nomadic tribes. Begins with the conquest of the Hanates of uh, Kazan and Astrahan in the 1550s by uh, Ivan the Terrible. You also move south uh, to deal with the what then became the challenge of the Ottoman Empire and westward uh, to deal with the uh, the challenges that were presented by both Sweden and Poland uh, in the uh, 17th and early 18th century. Remember, the Poles uh, were in Moscow uh, in the latter uh, uh, years of the of the time of troubles. Uh, the Swedish uh, king, uh, Charles X, launched an invasion uh, of, uh, of Russia in the early 18th century. And so from the Russian standpoint, what you had as you began to expand uh, uh, for what you would call security reasons, as you began to uh, absorb uh, new and uh, non-Russian populations, uh, you found yourself in the face of a uh, of a strategic dilemma. And that was, how did you defend uh, this vast country, sparsely populated country, multi-ethnic country on a landmass with very few uh, formal physical barriers that was a budding unstable region or powerful neighbors. And the Russian response to this was buffer zones, regional hegemony, strict internal control, disruption of alliances along your borders. Now, I think from the Moscow standpoint, the expansion uh, was largely, in a strategic sense, defensive. Uh, they were seeking security. But obviously, if you were on the other side of this, uh, if you were above the pole, uh, for example, the Russian expansion was very aggressive and imperialistic. Uh, and this has always created the tension between the way the Russians think about uh, their foreign policy and, way their, and the way their neighbors react. Now, the United States followed a different, um, uh, a different uh, course in its expansionism. They say Russia, uh, we can make the argument, expanded out of necessity, uh, out of security concerns. The argument I would make for the United States is that largely the United States has expanded uh, since the very early period of the, uh, of the founding of the country out of ambition. Uh, and I'd explain it this way. If you look at the United States, uh, the United States, contrary to Russia, probably had the best location uh, that you could find in the world for the development of a great power in time. Uh, the key to the North American continent uh, is really this vast Mississippi River Basin uh, that lies between the Appalachian Mountains uh, in the east uh, and 
the Rocky Mountains in the West. Uh, it is the largest contiguous area of arable land in the world. It has some of the richest soil in the world. It has this very intricate uh, river network, uh, the rivers, the tributaries that flow into the, uh, uh, to the Mississippi. They make it very easy to take the product uh, of this region, this very productive region, and bring it out uh, into other parts of the country and indeed uh, the world. Uh, the United States also has a coastline uh, that is sharply indented and created numerous natural harbors, uh, which provided protection for a merchant fleet, but also ready access uh, to the global waters. And so the challenge for the United States uh, in the early years after uh, independence was really to gain control of the Mississippi River Basin. And once it had control of that, uh, it had no fear of great power competition on the North American continent. The geography, the topography in the North would not support a great power, nor would the geography uh, and topography to the South in Mexico support another great power. And then you had the two oceans, uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic acting as a moat against the great power rivalries uh, elsewhere in the world. The United States gets half of the Mississippi River Basin on, upon independence uh, from Great Britain, and it gets the, the second half of that, the larger half, west of the Mississippi, in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. Now, after this, America is set uh, in North America, uh, no great power rivalries. It filled that land, it filled the continent uh, largely in the 19th century. As I said, by the end of the century, it's looking abroad. Uh, for its, uh, for markets and so forth. Now, there's no reason the United States had to do this. Uh, it could have remained uh, within its North American bastion and have been secure and prosperous. But the whole essence of the United States was to maintain this robust uh, expansion. Uh, there was concern that the great productivity of the United States could not be absorbed domestically, and this would lead to problems down the road. So in order to maintain a very successful economy, uh, the United States had to continue to grow. And so it moved abroad into East Asia, led to conflict with Russia in Manchuria, as we've already seen, but it continued that expansion into Europe, in fact, along the entire periphery uh, of Russia in the 19th century uh, and the 20th century. And this leads to uh, a situation where historically, if you want to put it in a very brief term, Russian expansion out of necessity for security runs into American expansion out of ambition. Uh, and this leads to a, a continuous conflict between the two countries that has played itself out into the current day. Finally, uh, the question of exceptionalism or uh, what we might call um, the way each country thought about its role in global affairs. Uh, and here we see that we come at this issue and end up in very different <clears throat> positions. Now, when you look at Russia, um, and as commentators have looked at Russia, uh, they've made much of what you might call Russian messianism. Uh, this idea that Russia had a special role in the world uh, to play, uh, and that this messianic ideas that changed from time to time created a fundamentally aggressive imperialist Russian state. And things that are pointed to are, for example, uh, this idea of Moscow being the third Rome. Um, it's developed in the late 15th uh, and early 16th century. The idea that Russia is the final bastion of Christianity, uh, in the world after the fall of the Byzantine Empire uh, in 1453. Uh, Moscow becomes the third Rome. The Tsar becomes the universal uh, Christian sovereign with the obligation to defend Christianity uh, against uh, the infidels everywhere uh, in the world. You also have the idea emerge at this time of Holy Russia uh, of a population that is illuminated by the Christian faith and it's the real uh, sort of bulwark of Christianity in the world. And again, 
uh, with an obligation to defend that religion and to extend it, extend it beyond Russia board, Russian borders. In the 19th century, uh, the idea of pan-Slavism uh, emerges. Again, Russia as the center of a Slavic empire that would take in, uh, into uh, or under its wing uh, the Slavic population of East Central Europe, uh, the Poles, the Czechs, for example. But more importantly at this time, uh, the Slavic uh, peoples of the Balkans uh, who were uh, attempting to achieve their independence from Ottoman rule at that time. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have the, the one that is probably uh, most potent, the whole idea of communism uh, in, the, in the 20th century, uh, the ideology uh, that lay behind the Soviet Union uh, throughout, uh, throughout its existence. Uh, now, uh, it's clear that these forms of Russian messian messianism existed. But I think the important point as we try to understand Russian foreign conduct uh, is that there's very little evidence that any of these ideas, uh, with the exception of communists, which I'll come to in a minute, had any real dramatic impact on the conduct uh, of the Russian state. If you look at the Muscovite period, as I've already suggested, expansion uh, initially was largely about for dynastic regions, the gathering of the Russian lands. Uh, when uh, Ivan uh, the Terrible uh, conquers uh, Kazan and Astrahan, uh, two Muslim dominated uh, territories. He doesn't try to um, expand the Orthodox religion. He's not converting Saul. He's, he's overtaking this region largely for security reasons. There's no evidence uh, throughout the Muscovite period that any of the czars saw their conquests abroad uh, as a, a part and parcel uh, of a campaign to extend the writ uh, of orthodoxy uh, or even to defend uh, any orthodox people from, uh, uh, from their enemies. Uh, so Moscow, the third Rome, uh, had no real impact on, uh, on Muscovite foreign policy conduct. If you get into the imperial pe period, starting with Peter the Great, uh, going forward to the end uh, in 1917, the Russian state is not dominated by ideology. Uh, it's not making an effort to, ex uh, to expand its form of government abroad. Russia is engaged uh, very much in balance of power politics uh, in the European continent, uh, trying to maintain itself uh, as a great power, but also uh, very cognizant that it needed to maintain uh, balance among all the great powers as, uh, as a foundation for its own security going forward. Uh, some people have looked at uh, Alexander I at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the Holy Alliance, uh, as an example of Russian messianism. If you look at this more closely, uh, you'll see that the Holy Alliance was largely inspired by Western examples, not Russian examples, um, that it included Orthodox uh, monarchs, Catholic monarchs, uh, and Protestant monarchs. This wasn't a, an alliance in any way that was supposed to expand orthodoxy. What it was intended to do uh, was to base uh, the European balance of power system uh, on an ethical foundation, a Christian foundation, which is the foundation of European civilization at this point. And it was supposed to be a foundation for supporting the status quo, that is monarchical rule uh, throughout Europe and indeed uh, throughout the world to the extent uh, that power, European powers extend, extended beyond Europe. Nicholas I uh, follows in Alexander the first way, uh, very much uh, making an effort to defend uh, monarchical legitimacy throughout Europe. It's not an expansion, it's, it's not a revolutionary power. In fact, it's a status quo uh, power and it's not based on a, a uh, unique Russian system of government. It's based on what is a generalized system throughout Europe at this time. And that continues uh, throughout the 19th century into the 20th century. Now, as I said, with communism, it's a bit different. Uh, obviously, this was an ideology uh, uh, that guided the state. But I think the important thing to remember here uh, uh, 
is, is twofold. First, for the early Bolshevik uh, leaders, communism wasn't about Russia. Uh, they managed to achieve the first initial victory of the uh, of the global revolution in Russia, but the idea was that this would radiate outward. It would spark revolutions elsewhere in the world, uh, and Russia uh, was not destined to be the center of a international communist movement. Uh, it would be on the periphery uh, of the communist movements that would then dominate the more advanced countries uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Uh, the second point uh, is that this revolutionary zeal actually wore out very quickly uh, in Russia after the difficulties of, of the civil war, the intervention, uh, the complicated war with Poland at that time. Uh, and from a movement that was uh, sort of radiating, radiating outside of Moscow, what we see uh, is a development under Stalin of the idea of socialism in one country. Uh, and the socialist camp uh, is supposed to be or the communist international communist movement is supposed to be a defender of the sovereignty and independence of the Soviet state. Uh, and from the 1930s onward, it's really realpolitik, this balance of power, the European uh, foreign policy tradition uh, that structures the Soviet Union's engagement in the world. I think you can make an argument that continues in various forms uh, to the very end of the Soviet Union. The ideology remained largely as a rhetoric for discussing uh, Russian policy or explaining it uh, to, the, to the Soviet public and a ritual that the leadership went through uh, as it discussed various issues, uh, but very much uh, to support uh, foreign policy that was conducted on the basis of national interest uh, and realpolitik. Now, this is quite different from the way the United States developed. Uh, the United States uh, thinks of itself as an exceptional country from the very beginning. And it's a view that dominates both the elites and the public as a whole. And as a basis, in fact, the United States really was an exceptional country uh, in, the, in its founding uh, in the 18th century, a democratic Republican form of government, the first in the world, uh, a government uh, in which power uh, of the, of the national government was actually delegated uh, by the states and the broader population. Uh, the only question for the United States was how you would do this. Would you take the shining city on the hill example of the early, uh, or the early American Republic or the more missionary approach of actively trying uh, to advance democracy throughout the world, either through persuasion or ultimately through uh, through force. So a very different uh, form of, uh, of exceptionalism. A, an exceptionalism is based on a sense of uni 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 universalist ideology, uh, which has pretensions to expand and fill all the nooks and crannies in the world. So again, you have very two very different views of how a state should conduct itself uh, on foreign uh, abroad in the world, and this leads to conflict to the United States. Let me end with the following. I think if you look at the history of these two countries, you will see that the rivalry that we have at this time is systemic in nature. This is not a question of misunderstanding. It's not a, uh, a consequence of the idios idiosyncrasies of various leaders. It's very much grounded in history, the way the two countries think of themselves, the way they have developed over the past uh, couple of hundred years or more. And this doesn't mean uh, that the United States and Russia can't cooperate on the global stage. Uh, what it means is uh, that it takes uh, very good leaders, leaders that are aware of the fundamental contradiction and work within those uh, to find ways that cooperate to mutual advantage. Uh, and that leads to the question of how these two countries should conduct their foreign policy, how they should relate to one another over the next decade and beyond uh, if we want to build a more prosperous and secure world, that's good for both Russia and the United States. That is going to be the topic that we're going to discuss tomorrow. So let me end there. Uh, and I'm more than happy to engage your questions, but I'm also interested in hearing your criticism. Thank you.